everybody and welcome. My name is Nancy Gonzalez and I am the Dean of Natural Sciences here in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. I have the honor of convening our event for tonight, the official launch for Randolph Nessie's new book, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Can Evolutionary Thinking Improve Psychiatric Treatment? In this book, Randy pro provides a very compelling argument that evolutionary biology can provide a missing link, a, 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 a missing foundation for psychiatry that can lead to, uh, that can resolve um, prevalent controversies, ongoing controversies and struggles for the field, leading to new lines of research and perhaps also new approaches to treatment. Those are questions that we will tackle in our discussion today, discuss, perhaps debate. Um, the book has received outstanding reviews thus far and actually had its initial launch in London at a recent event. Tonight we have another wonderful program planned, a panel discussion with three distinguished scholars who will each bring different perspectives. Is that right? Okay. Okay. So, so tonight we will uh, have three distinguished panelists who will provide different perspectives on the book. Um, tonight's event I expect will be different. Um, for example, tonight we're going to start with the animated version of the rap song that you just heard. Um, that was created and performed by Baba Brinkman uh, that was inspired specifically by Randy's book. So, cue it up. Future plans I can't 
be sharp and intense And no less painful when I'm making it make sense How many weeks get to elapse after a major event Before the DSM is ready to say I'm depressed Drifting in a day Contemplating giving up Feeling like a bacterium of flailing cilia Of course it's better to chart random courses Than persist in one direction into a vortex So true, organisms do what they're supposed to Act as if fitness enhancement is the only rule Evolution rule is high mood more sense when you read the book if you haven't already. Um, so what I know about Baba Brinkman, the creator of this, and I, this is the, the first time it's being shown, and I think this is not the, quite the final cut. Not quite Not ready. quite the final cut, but right. he's a New York-based rap artist and playwright. He's best known for the rap guide series of science-based hip-hop albums and theater shows uh, that currently showing off-Broadway, British Village, I believe. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Nessie Randy will probably tell us more about that and the origins of this particular piece um, when he takes the uh, microphone in just a few minutes. Um, then we're going to hear from our three panelists uh, uh, who, are, who will come up uh, one by one to share their thoughts on the following question. Can evolutionary thinking relieve psychiatry's troubles and ours? Joining us to address this question and provoke discussion we have distinguished evolutionary psychologist and president's professor of psychology at ASU, Dr. Doug Kenrick. We also have world-renowned primatologist, anthropologist, and professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Chain Change, Dr. Joan Silk, and award-winning psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry at the Mayo Medical College, Dr. Cynthia Stonington. Later, I will say a little bit more about each of them as they come up to address tonight's question. Then we'll open the floor for discussion. So as we go, remember your questions, jot them down as you need to. We'll go one by one, and then we'll open up for discussion. But, so, but now, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Randolph Nessie. Randy is ASU Foundation Professor in the School of Life Sciences, where he became the founding director of the Center for Evolution and Medicine in 2014. Previously, he was professor of psychiatry and of psychology at the University of Michigan, where he led the Evolution and Human Adaptation Program and helped to establish one of the world's first anxiety disorders clinic. He's widely acknowledged as a leader in the field of evolutionary medicine. With evolutionary biologist uh, George Williams, he authored the book, Why We Get Sick, The New Science 
of Darwinian medicine that initiated much of the new work in the field at the time. His own research is, is widely uh, varying. He studies the role of anxiety in aging, how selection shapes mechanisms that regulate basic defense mechanisms such as pain, fever, anxiety, low mood. He studies the origins and functions of emotions and why emotions are so common, bad emotions, good emotions, and how social selection has shaped human capacities for things like altruism and morality. Dr. Nessie is founder of the Human Behavior and Evolutionary Society in 1988. He's current president of the International Society for Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, a distinguished life fellow for the uh, American Psychiatric Association, a fellow for the American Psychological Society, and an elected fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences. Um, please give a round of applause and congratulations to our fe featured author. My goodness, I'm so grateful to Dean Gonzalez for hosting us at this event and emceeing us and keeping us all on time. Is my uh oh? Mike, You're not supposed to. Like about there. A Lenora knows just how to do this. Well, do you want to, are you going to speak that way mostly? Yeah. Okay. And as she's getting me wired, I'll just express more thanks for our other panelists and especially for our staff, um, including Lenora and Jennifer and who else is here. Um, we're so grateful to everyone for making this possible. Um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks relatively short. I'm aiming at 18 minutes, and I'm going to ask to be interrupted at about that, that point. I'll give myself two minutes to go on if I get too enthusiastic. But I want to make sure, I mean, the real occasion for this evening is to have comments from other people. And I'm very curious what they might have to say about the book. In particular, is it actually useful or is it just interesting? Um, and I'm now on page three, so let's go back. So before we go any further, just a brief note that this whole topic is quite delicate and personal. And talking about all of our emotions and depression and grief and guilt and everything in raw scientific terms, it can seem kind of cold and, and not very sympathetic. So I think we need to be very careful when talking about these kinds of things. Also, I have lots of stories to tell about patients. And that's a delicate matter because you really don't want to go to a psychiatrist who might be writing about you. And I promise you that all the cases you'll hear here and in the book are so completely disguised that patients wouldn't even recognize themselves. But even so, I could not write this book while I was still in practice because, you know, it's just not right to be in practice and, and having people read what you're writing about these disorders and, and other kind of things. So ASU has made this possible. Without ASU, I wouldn't have been able to finish this book, uh, certainly in this way. I'm going back to you know, William Butler Yeats on his gravestone had carved, um, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen ride on. And that's interesting. He wanted people to, and did anybody write? No, every year people try to raise money for a giant mausoleum for him. And this is our human nature. We just don't want simple scientific explanations for such things. We want something personal and all the rest. Going back to patients who will remain anonymous, this one isn't quite as anonymous. She might eventually recognize herself because she drove down from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And she came and the, the resident told me, this is a tough one, get ready. I said, okay, what, what does she want? She wants answers. She wants answers from the university. I said, well, what, what answers does she want? And he said, well, she's gotten four different diagnoses and recommendations from four different people. And she's come down here to get the definitive answers. I said, okay, so we saw her. And she said she first saw her general doctor. And he said, it's a bowel problem and anxiety. And he gave her some pills. And she said they didn't work. He sent her to a therapist. And she said, I tried that therapist. And after like seeing him twice a week for many, many weeks, he started asking about my sexual feelings towards my father. And that was creepy. So I just didn't keep going back to him. So after that, I tried my minister. And he said I just didn't have enough faith. And after that, I finally found a psychiatrist I could go to. And he examined me and he said, you've got a brain disorder. You need to take this drug. But the drug had side effects that might include suicide. So I decided to come down here to the university and find out which is right. Whoa, that's a challenging patient. And most anxiety patients, I mean, she, had, she had what I call syndrome 101. She said, I'm anxious. I don't sleep very well. My bowels don't work very well. I don't have much energy. I'm irritable. And there might be some marital problems. And I'm drinking a little bit. <laughs> 
This is like your actual real patient. I'm, I'm going to switch you. You're still a little soft in the back. Okay. I'm going to have you hold one of the, okay. the handheld American flashlight. Okay. Okay. Testing, yeah, that'll be much better. Thank you, and now you can hear me in the back. So here comes the punchline from this. Um, we helped her, we got her connected with a cognitive behavioral therapist in her area. Eventually she was grateful for that, but I'll always remember as she turned and just went out the door, she touched the doorknob and she says, but Dr. Nessie, you know your profession's very confused. You know that, right? And she just gave me this stare. And I thought, oh, yeah, I guess I actually do know that because I had been working in a medical clinic at the time. I was the embedded psychiatrist. And guess who you get to see if you're the psychiatrist in a medical clinic? All the other doctors say, please see this patient who has headaches, but I think they're psychological. Please see this patient whose weakness I think is psych You see all these patients who have already tried psychiatry and they're sick of it and they don't want to do it anymore. And it was my job to try to convince them to get, try it again, even though their first go hadn't worked. There were also lots of patients in that practice who actually got enormous help, but they didn't complain, so nobody sent them to me. I only saw the patients who were not too happy with what experience they had had before. This warps your experience. I was biased uh, by that kind of experience to not think of psychiatry as a be-all and end-all, cure-all. But let me pause right here and remind you that Psychiatry is such a wonderful profession. I, mean, I can't think of any area in medicine that's more satisfying. I mean, most of your patients get better, and you have relationships with them, and it's just so wonderful to actually be able to treat most people successfully. I miss it um, quite badly um, doing the kind of job that I'm doing now. So I'm not criticizing psychiatry in terms of its effectiveness and its worthiness as a profession. However, its theoretical foundation is where we need to go next. I came into psychiatry in the late 70s. It was just at the point of giant transition. Um, Rosenhan had just done his study where he had students go into emergency rooms and say, I'm hearing voices, thud, empty, death. All 12 of them were admitted to psychiatric hospitals, diagnosed with schizophrenia, even though they acted normal afterwards. The same year, 1973, the Psychiatric Association decided on whether homosexuality was a disease or not and they voted to say it was not. About the same time, they started showing videos of a patient to doctors in the UK and here, and I think it was you know, three out of 16 in the UK said it was schizophrenia, and 15 out of 16 here said, there was no diagnostic reliability, and your insurance companies didn't want to pay for any treatment anymore unless it was for medical disorders. I came into the psychiatry at a crisis point, and the solution to that crisis was to reform diagnosis. The DSM-3 was published in 1980, and it replaced opinions with a checklist. If you have five of these and six of these for two weeks or more, you got the diagnosis. We don't care about anything else. This made diagnosis reliable for the first time. Epidemiology was possible. But what it revealed was something unanticipated. Massive comorbidity. Most patients who had one problem also had other problems. Also, within a single group, like depression, some patients with depression, both diagnosed, didn't have a single symptom in common. That was problematic. So, but it did form a way of doing research, and it's now been nearly 40 years of research. Um, about $40 billion has been spent on research uh, using these diagnostic categories. And the hope in 1980 was that each one of these would eventually be found to be caused by specific brain abnormality and would be replaced with valid diagnoses based on the brain abnormalities or genetic abnormalities. And we'd have a blood test to diagnose each of those things. There has been no greater disappointment in any field than the fact that this has not worked. At this point, the DSM-5 has come in. And in the DSM-5, there are no diagnoses that are justified by any test of any kind, not scans, not genes, not hormones, not anything. At the diagnostic system itself, on the page one of the leading psychiatric textbook, it says, uh, there is no justification for thinking these diagnoses are valid. After the smartest people in the world have worked on this for many, many years. Furthermore, the search for brain abnormalities has failed. 
Now there are brain differences, there must be, there are, between people with depression and others, people with schizophrenia and others. There are real differences, some of which are statistically significant, but none of them large enough to make a diagnosis. And the biggest disappointment is that while we have made progress treatment-wise, no dramatic new treatments have come in this time. And most recently, we've been looking for genes, and we have now done the whole genome some of these disorders are profoundly genetic. Whether you get them or not depends on your genes. And we're now very confident that there are no common genes that increase your risk by more than 1%. I have always stayed very far away from the P word, because everybody is always bandying about paradigm this and paradigm that. And so tonight, with you, for the first time, I'm going to go on record and say, this paradigm is failing. It just is not working. People are desperate for some other approach. Tom Insel, a head of National Institutes of Mental Health, was quoted as saying, what we've been doing for five decades, it ain't working. When I look at the numbers of suicides, disabilities, the mortality data, it's abysmal and it's not getting any better. Maybe we just need to rethink this whole approach. So who can we turn to for inspiration? Well, Albert Einstein said that if you give me a problem and my life depends on it and I have one hour to solve it, I would have spent the first 55 minutes trying to figure out what the right question is. Because once I did that, I could solve the problem in the last five minutes. So the whole rest of my talk is going to be on what my career has really been about. And that is calling attention to a group of new questions. So where did they come from? Well, first of all, I went to the Museum of Natural History at the University of Michigan. And there I found a group of behavior scientists and ethologists and evolutionary biologists. And they welcomed me, even though I didn't know much of anything. They were, they were curious about whether they could help. Uh, a doctor, and they were curious about medicine, too, because they thought they could be useful, and they were useful. The first thing they taught me was that I had only been using half of biology. The other half, the evolutionary half, asking how things actually, not just how they work, but why they're there, I hadn't even known that was a legitimate question. But all of animal behavior is based on that, and I hadn't learned anything about that in a very good education in psychology and medicine and psychiatry. That led to, so that's question number one that was new for me, but is routine elsewhere. Question two is a new one that really got traction after George Williams and I worked together. That question was, why isn't the body better? Why didn't natural selection make us better protected against diseases? And it was George's 1957 paper about aging that completely changed the trajectory of my career. He pointed out that a genetic variation that makes you age faster and does something like calcify your coronary arteries, can nonetheless become universal if it does something when selection is stronger in youth, like make your bones heal faster. I thought, oh my god, there's an explanation for aging. What about breast cancer? What about schizophrenia? What about ulcers? What about all these other diseases? Very soon, George and I worked together and wrote a paper, and then a book, and other papers, encouraging attention to this question, and that's really taken off. And it's now the field of evolutionary medicine, which is much broader than just our idea, I should emphasize, but has led to things like Arizona State University being the first place in the country to create a major program in evolution medicine. And I'm so grateful for the vision of Michael Crow and others here uh, to make that possible. It's just remarkable. And now lots of other places are copying ASU and creating their own problems their own systems. The ideas that George and I came up with were quite simple. It was that there are several different reasons for bodies not being better. One of them is um, natural selection just can't do better. Mutations happen. Another is that natural selection is slow, so abnormal environments and pathogens evolve fast and we can't. But the other ones are more important. Everything's a trade-off. Nothing can be perfect. And the biggest, most disturbing one is we're not shaped for health, happiness, or longevity. Any of mutation that makes you have more babies is going to be selected for even if it makes you die young and live an unhappy life. And the last category are things that are useful responses that just seem like diseases. And that's where we're going next, to emotions. I decided after treating emotional disorders for about 10 years that I'd better learn about them. So I had to set aside a whole year and read everything I could. At the end of that year, I was experiencing emotions. I was experiencing frustration and boredom and confusion. It was just awful. And I was pretty much ready to give up. And then I found William James. He read the literature on the emotions 100 years previously and said, as far as the scientific study of the emotions goes, I may have been surfeited by too much reading, but I'd as sure leaf 
read verbal descriptions as the shape of rocks on a New Hampshire farm. And he goes on to say just how disturbed and bored he was by that literature. I went further into the evolution of the emotions. How am I doing on time? OK. Um, and discovered that Darwin's book about the emotions is really not about their functions. Darwin's book about the emotions was showing that they're similar in different species. In fact, there's a wonderful article about Darwin's anti-Darwinian theory of the emotions. That had a big effect on me to realize that the track I was on about trying to see what emotions were for was different. Then I found lots of psychologists who said, the function of anger is, the function of love is, the function of anxiety is. And that kind of made sense. They had their functions. But as I thought about where they came from, it became very clear that emotions are shaped to cope with situations. They're special modes of operation, like little computer programs, that go off when you're in a certain situation. And that turns out to be a very different view, and it's caught on quite a lot. I think of all my contributions, that might be the largest, to think about emotions in terms of the situations that arouse them. This means that you can't tell if an emotion is normal or not unless you analyze the situation. And our diagnostic system pays no attention to that whatsoever. So that's the third question. In what situation is this emotion useful? Um, a quite different question, which leads to specific emotions. It's easy for anxiety, right? We all know that anxiety is useful in situations of threat and danger. OK, this means you immediately start thinking about what about people who don't have enough anxiety? Hypophobia. Nobody studies them. Uh, they end up in the morgue. Um, they end up in unemployment lines and court. Um, but there are people who don't have enough anxiety, and they do not line up to get into our anxiety disorders clinic. Question four, though, is different. It's, why is there so much excess anxiety? It's really obvious that most of us have too much anxiety that's good, that's not, than we need. And for you know, social phobia, standing up and talking in front of people, more than 50% of people can hardly do it at all because they're too nervous about it. That's weird. Why would we be shaped so that most of us have too much anxiety? And I think the answer to that, part of it, is called the smoke detector principle. It is that natural selection shapes all of these responses to go off whenever the benefit is greater than the cost. And the cost of something like a panic attack is maybe 100 calories. The cost of not having a panic attack, if the noise behind that rock is a lion, might be 100,000 calories. And that means natural selection will shape that mechanism to set off a panic attack whenever the chance of that noise being a lion is greater than one in a thousand. And that means that out of that thousand panic attacks, one will be necessary, and 999 will be unnecessary, but still perfectly normal. This is the first thing that profoundly changed my practice. I was seeing hundreds of anxiety disorders patients that told them, it's your brain, and they say, thank you, thank you. But when I start, once I started saying, it's a normal, useful response, and you're having a false alarm, like a smoke detector, my patients started saying, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to quit worrying about this, and maybe I'll come back and see you if I have enough money next week. Um, now we come to a harder one. What about low mood? Is there any situation in which low mood could be useful? That seems really preposterous. We should all be positive all the time, right? And enthusiastic and full of energy. And I think of my distant relatives living on an island in the North Sea for the last thousand years. And there probably were some who were really enthusiastic and optimistic and perky. And in February, they said, I don't care about you pessimists. I'm going to go out and find some food. I know there's something out there. And of course, those ancestors of mine didn't have any children because they died young. The ancestors who had children were the ones who were kind of anxious and depressed and stayed all winter quietly indoors, which is why most of us, Norwegians, have strong tendencies uh, to be quiet and depressed and anxious, at least in the wintertime. If I had to say in what situation low mood is useful, it's whenever people are pursuing an unreachable goal. And this is not my idea. Klinger wrote about this in 1975. Nancy Cantor wrote about this. Ten psychologists have written about this. It's just that psychologists don't know anything about what psychologists have been doing. Psychiatrists don't know what psychologists have been doing. Well worked out work on Carver and Shire also. Marvelous work. Mood changes depending on your rate of approach towards your goal. And if you're not making progress, low mood shifts your effort to something more productive. And if you don't shift, you're in real trouble. My residents tell me the single most useful thing I ever taught them is ask your depressed patients if there's something really, really important they're trying to do that they can't succeed at and they can't give up. 
And that question gets you to the absolute nubbin of a problem that often didn't come across before. My kid is on heroin, won't talk to me on the phone, but I've got to stop my kid from using heroin. My partner won't stop drinking, got to stop, you know, the terrible problems people get into often turn out to be perfect for causing depression. This means that in order to understand a person's emotions, you have to understand them one at a time. Asking about their goals, their plans, their hopes, their expectations. Our moods are about our future more than our past. And this means you can't just do a checklist. You've got to do something else. Grief and love deserve talking about. Why on earth grief? That doesn't make any sense. It's so awful. Is it an epiphenomenon or is it useful? That's an unanswered question, which I've worked on and other people have too. What about the capacity for guilt and morality? I think people's idea that natural selection means cynicism, um, I've worked so hard to try to counter that by talking about how natural selection can shape us for morality and real, genuine, loving relationships. That's crucial, I think, for really applying evolution in the clinic. Other emotions, jealousy, that's not for us, it's for our genes. People who have jealousy may have more offspring, but at a terrible cost to their relationships and their own happiness. There's a whole chapter in the book about sexual disorders. Why on earth is it that the whole system isn't better coordinated? Every sex book has a chapter on men having orgasms too fast and women having them too slow or not at all. And no book mentions, so why is that? There's a fairly easy answer, I think, but you'll have to read the book to find out. Eating disorders, everybody talks about why some people get them and other people don't, and it turns out that um, if you try to stop your eating, there's a mechanism to protect your nutrition, and it's called gorging. That's what everybody does, and then they get terrified that they're gaining weight. I'll skip the talk about why genes for schizophrenia and bipolar persist, but there are good evolutionary reasons for that. I'll wrap up just by saying that the last questions are, why on earth hasn't psychiatry used this basic science? What can we do about it? And can it be useful? And I'm counting on my other panelists to talk more about how it can be useful. I think they'll have very interesting things to say, and I look forward to their comments. Thank you very much. That was a very quick run through a lot of material from, from your book. Um, next, we're going to turn to Doug Kenrick, um, who will comment perhaps on what Randy just said, or who knows what he'll comment on. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Doug, and then we'll invite him to come up, and I, I guess he takes the mic from up here. Doug is an ASU uh, President's Professor of Psychology at Arizona State University. He's a leading figure in evolutionary psychology and current president of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. He studied social psychology under Robert Cialdini here at ASU and received his PhD here. And luckily, ASU has been very fortunate to have retained him since. Um, he is an author of over 170 scientific articles, books, and book chapters, the majority applying evolutionary theory to human cognition and behavior and that synthesizes across three primary areas, evolutionary psychology, cognitive sciences, and dynamical systems theory. His publications cover a wide range of topics from altruism to conformity, uh, homo, uh, homicidal fantasies, human mate selection, personality, and racial stereotyping, to, to name a few. Um, he often likes quite controversial topics. Um, much of his research has examined sex differences in cognition and behavior and has applied evolutionary theory to try to understand human, human nature and human behavior. He has edited several um, influential books on evolutionary psychology, including uh, two multi-edition uh, textbooks that are widely used in the field. He writes a blog for Psychology Today magazine um, titled Sex, Murder, and the Meaning of Life, and he's published a book of that same title. So Doug is an ideal choice, I think, to kick off the response to, to Randy. So please come on up, Doug. Um, 
So uh, <clears throat> almost 50 years ago, I first passed by this spot when it was a big parking lot. Uh, that's when Randy Nessie was probably in medical school uh, studying to be a psychiatrist. I think we're the same age. Um, and uh, while he was on his way to classes, maybe, did you go to Michigan? Or um, I was on my way to classes here at ASU, uh, which was then uh, called Fort Skinner in the Desert. And it was a behaviorist stronghold. And I came here because I wanted to be a Skinnerian psychotherapist. But I dropped out. Um, for some of the reasons you talked about, things were a little depressing about the outcomes of psychotherapy in those days. Uh, <clears throat> but partially, I just I enjoyed working in the lab with smart students more than I did working with people who were um, miserable. Um, and I, as I was reading your book, I was thinking, if this perspective was around, I might have stayed in clinical psychology. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, behaviorists, there's a lot to like about behaviorism. Uh, <clears throat> But behaviors like to say at the time that they didn't really care about theory, and they didn't really care about what was going on in the head, because you couldn't scientifically uh, examine what was going on inside the head. Uh, but even though they said they didn't have a theory, they really did kind of mostly assume the uh, blank slate perspective on human nature. Uh, behaviorists assume that everything that we do, every choice you make, it's a function of rewards and punishments from the outside, from your parents, from your peers, from your teachers, and so on. Um, and I remember when I asked one of my professors, uh, who's a, a clinical behaviorist, you didn't, you didn't know him, he left before you, I think, uh, Austin Jones, did you ever meet him? Um, <clears throat> in any event, uh, I said, hey, uh, Professor Jones, uh, I just was reading this research that suggests that identical twins, if one of them has schizophrenia, and uh, the other one is even raised in a separate home, there's a very high probability they'll be concordant. In fact, the probability that the two schizophrenics who are, are identical twins will, you know, that they'll both be schizophrenic is exactly the same whether or not they're raised together or raised separately. And he uh, kind of scoffed at me and said, Doug, they had the same intrauterine environment. And that was his explanation, OK? Uh, and that, that made it so we didn't have to think anymore about the possible biological basis of schizophrenia. Um, now, behaviorists were uh, guilty of a problem that uh, Professor Nessie goes into a lot in his book, which is treating symptoms as the disease. And so here's an example of that. Uh, <clears throat> I remember reading a paper when I was a graduate student. And it was a behavioral treatment of someone who was having auditory hallucinations. And I don't, I don't remember what the hallucinations were, but typically when you're having auditory hallucinations, it means that either God or the Virgin Mary or the devil is speaking to you and telling you to do something, OK? Um, <clears throat> and uh, so the behaviorists actually published a paper with their brilliant treatment for this, which is basically every time he said something that's about God speaking to him or something crazy, they would ignore him, turn away from him. Every time he said something that sounded sane, they'd pat him on the back and give him an M&M, &M, OK? I don't know if they use an M&M, &M, but they would reward him every time he said something. And then they, uh, they said, well, mission accomplished, right? He wasn't saying as many crazy things. But I got to guess that he was still just, there was as many crazy thoughts going around inside of his head. But behaviorists didn't care about that. Um, so, it, you know, if you take the approach of trying to erase symptoms without asking what they're symptoms of, it's sort of analogous to if somebody comes in with measles, you give them some makeup and say goodbye, right? Uh, and uh, Randy's book talks quite a bit about that, that problem, uh, which is especially, it's not as prevalent in medicine as, as I thought it was interesting to, to read about. Um, you wouldn't treat somebody with abdominal pain with just giving pain relievers and say goodbye, you try to figure out, is this cancer? Uh, but with, if it's anxiety, you can reduce the anxiety, send them back into their same crazy life uh, with the anti-anxiety meds, and that's it. Uh, he's already mentioned some of the ideas I like most, but I'll mention them. This idea of trade-offs, that the, the model in clinical psychology uh, then at least, and probably to some extent now, was that people who live in normal homes, like Ozzy and Harriet in the 1950s, you know, with two cute kids, uh, and uh, 
a suburban home, and everybody who communicates in a friendly way and smiles at each other, that's normal. Anything else is a failure. It's a breakdown in the system. So if you happen to come from the ghetto, uh, if you happen to, I came from a bad neighborhood where all of my male relatives went. I was the only one who shamed the family by not going to Sing Sing. Um, and in, in my neighborhood, people were rebellious. Uh, people took drugs. People drank a lot. People had premarital sex. People acted unconventional. Uh, and there's evolutionary psychologists, uh, who, some of whom have worked with uh, Dr. Nessie, point out that instead of seeing those as breakdowns, sometimes it's just making the best of the, of the threats and the opportunities in your ecology. Sometimes that turns out to be a better strategy because they don't have the middle class options that uh, <clears throat> the people treating them do. Um, a great example of the trade-off uh, problem which Dr. Nessie goes into is male versus female riskiness. Males, females have the right level of anxiety, according to Professor Nessie. Males don't. And you can, how do you know? Look at the statistics on deaths by accident. Males between the ages of something like 20 and 50 are about four times more likely, four times more likely to die in an accident or of a homicide. Well, why is that? Is it because males are broken? Some of you think, yes, that's a decent answer. Um, and uh, it turns out that actually it's, it's true across the animal kingdom in general. In most species, the females have higher initial parental investment, so they can be selective, and the males, have to, the males are going to contribute less. They have to say, look at me, look at me. Look at me doing this stupid thing. I'm Alex Honnold. I'm climbing up El Capitan without a rope. Yeah. If you go on. If you go on, uh, my son is a climber, but he doesn't, he uses a rope. Um, but he went on to Wikipedia and uh, he pointed out to me that 50% of the famous free climbers are dead. Um, so uh, <coughs> males have too low a level of anxiety. Um, but it's not because they're broken, it's because they're making a trade off. Uh, the smoke detector principle, which he mentioned, is a great one. Um, and I kind of love it, okay, this idea that, look, we have, just the way you, your smoke detector in your house, you don't want it set to never go off because the house will burn down. Uh, and so occasionally, it'll go, there'll be a false alarm. Somebody will walk by your house with a cigarette in the middle of the night, okay? Um, but when it comes to protecting yourself from lions, our ancestors had to have sensitive smoke detectors. Uh, and I, I love that idea because it's... I'm a neurotic, right? And it's, a great, it's great for me to think, yeah, this is, this is healthy. It's healthy for me to always worry about locking the doors and going to double check them again. One of my colleagues, Sarah Gutierrez, who I know you know, she used to always make fun of me. And she had three purses stolen out of her office because she would walk off and leave the door open. And I said, look, there's a point to being you know, neurotic. Um, and she needed to be more neurotic. Uh, <clears throat> The mismatch idea, it's a fabulous idea. Uh, Nessie and Marx have a, a really great classic paper um, in which they point, they talk about the fact that phobias, people have phobias not of guns or cars, which are actually likely to kill them in the modern world, but they have phobias of snakes, spiders, and sharks. Uh, and you're very unlikely to die from a snake or a spider or a shark, but they still scare us, and guns don't scare us as much. The final, uh, Randy asked that we not just laud his book, but, uh, which I do laud it. It's a, I think it's a very good book. Uh, I'd highly recommend it to, you know, to anybody who has problems with anxiety or uh, depression or controlling their eating or drinking, which is, if I missed anybody there, yeah, anybody, who's, anybody who that is, isn't in that list is in California somewhere sitting on a hill uh, saying ohm. Uh, <clears throat> but certainly if you're uh, in any clinical area, I say it's, it should be required reading. It's really got some great ideas. But in terms of the last, to say something controversial, which you and I can talk about later, um, I was a little disappointed in the treatment implications because I, I made fun of behaviorists for um, treating hallucinations with reinforcement of a verbal behavior. Nevertheless, behaviorists came up with a lot of great ideas. So for example, uh, Randy talks in one chapter about impulse control disorders like you know, overeating or overconsumption of alcohol or drugs or smoking. And it turns out that the, I think the best treatment for that is one that was invented by the behaviorist, stimulus control. Um, <clears throat> you know, stock your refrigerator, 
with fruits and vegetables and sugar-free, lime-flavored carbonated water and not with six packs of Stone IPA and Ben and Jerry's double chocolate fudge ice cream. Because it turns out that we're, we're, which as Randy will tell you, we're not really good at resisting temptation, but we're pretty good if it takes a lot of work to have to get up and walk to the store to get yourself that IPA, then you'll probably drink your, uh, your unflavored seltzer. Uh, and so what I would ask is the question of really what, techniques of treatment flow from an evolutionary perspective. And, I, and, and I'd like to hear more about that. Is there something that an evolutionary perspective would give us for treatment that we wouldn't get from behaviorism? Or is it just we use the behaviorist techniques in certain ways? So that's my question for Randy. Thanks. Good question. Thank you, Doug. Okay, so now we are going to invite Joan Silk to join us up here. Joan is a world-renowned primatologist and professor in ASU School of Human Evolution and Social Change. She moved here from UCLA in 2012. Um, Dr. Silk received her doctorate from the University of California, Davis, and postdoc fellow in the Altman Lab at the University of Chicago. She spent more than 20 years of her distinguished career as a professor at UCLA, where she was a founding member of the Center of Behavior, Evolution, and Culture. In a, uh, addition to numerous high-impact publications, she is co-author of the book, How Humans Evolved. And if I counted correctly, I think there have been eight editions and three translations of this very, very foundational book. In addition to um, Dr. Silk's research is focused pr principally on understanding how natural selection shapes the evolution of social behaviors in primates. Uh, most of the empirical work has focused on the behavioral and reproductive strategies of female baboons. For example, she's conducting a comparative study of the structure and function of close social bonds in, in four baboon species. In particular, her work is interested in questions that explicitly link studies of non-humans and uh, or primates and humans. Um, so I am very uh, interested to hear what Joan will add to our discussion. Yeah, so my credentials um, don't necessarily qualify me to be here. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. Um, here we go. Can you hear me? Good. So, uh, yeah, I have, like, I, I wandered into the wrong, the wrong program, I think. But, um, uh, so, when I think about Randy's work and think about and reading Randy's book, I read it through actually two different lenses. I read it through the lens of someone who has spent most of my academic career uh, looking for what Randy calls good reasons about why animals do what they do. Okay, so why do why do baboons behave the way they do? And uh, and um, I use evolutionary theory as a guide to help me answer those kinds of questions. So I spent a lot of time thinking about good reasons, and I think that field has been really productive. But, and this is something that uh, um, I also uh, affects me when I'm reading Randy's book, I read it through another lens, as somebody who, like many other people, has dealt with a certain number of bad feelings, right? And had their life influenced by um, a lack of being able to kind of calibrate, uh, manage, and cope with these bad feelings. So I, um, I read the smoke detector chapter very carefully because I have generalized anxiety disorder, which has been quite a problem. Um, and so I find it, you know, reading it, so, you know, good reasons for bad feelings is, is something that resonates uh, very strongly with me. So can, can evolutionary theory relieve psychiatry's troubles? You know, what can, it, what can evolutionary theory do for psychiatry and should psychiatry bother? 
And um, as an evolutionary biologist, um, I think the answer has to be yes. So there's a very famous evolutionary biologist named Theodosius Dobzhansky, who uh, uh, worked at the turn of the century and made many important discoveries in genetics. And Dobzhansky said, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. And that's a kind of founding, grounding principle for a lot of people who are biologists. And um, uh, if Dojansky is right, then it has to be true that evolutionary thinking can contribute to um, psychiatry. Because uh, our brains and our psychology are clearly part of biology. So the answer has to be yes. But I think the obvious caveat is yes, but maybe not quite yet. So that's the trick. Um, and I think it's because in contrast to the kind of things that I study, which is mainly behavior, um, the problems that psychologists have and um, and psychiatrists are, you know, basically people who have a clinical um, applied um, use for psychology. Um, uh, it's because the phenomena that they're studying is so much harder to get a grip on. And I think it makes it a fundamentally different kind of endeavor. Um, it's like trying to map the ocean floor when you can only see the things that poke above the surface, right? Um, we have some idea about where the parts are that poke above the ocean um, surface. And sometimes we even have a pretty good idea of the processes that create the parts that stick up. But we don't know very much about what lies below the surface. And we don't know very much about the processes, the effect, the shape, the size, and their characteristics. And uh, I think we don't understand it very well because it's really, really, really hard to understand. So it's a, it's a fundamentally, I think, more difficult problem. I think biology is more difficult than physics. It's more complicated. And I think psychology, human psychology, is a lot more difficult than the kinds of tasks that most evolutionary biologists set for themselves. And in a lot of ways, um, in reading the book and kind of seeing the landscape that Randy maps out, I'm really struck by the parallels between what Randy's trying to do now and what um, evolutionary biologists uh, uh, started to do in uh, basically late 60s, early 70s. So it turns out that what we take as evolutionary biology now um, is actually a pretty recent development in biology. So people knew about Darwin. People believed in Darwin. Biologists did. But they didn't really see how Darwin's ideas would be applied to understanding uh, why animals did what they did. And when they did think about it, they had the wrong answer, which is, as George Williams pointed out, which was because we do think, animals do things because they're good for the species. I mean, this doesn't, I mean, if you understand what Darwin wrote, and uh, as people began to think about what Darwin actually wrote and his actual ideas, that turns out to not work at all. So, but in the 60s with Bill Hamilton and John Maynard Smith and in the 70s, uh, people began to think about the idea that evolution might have shaped behavior in other organisms, uh, but they didn't have a really well-developed sense of, of how uh, it might work. How does evolution shape behavior? And um, it began as a mainly theoretical project based on applying principles on evolutionary theory to develop models for how natural selection would shape behavior. And people built really simple models that were useful for formalizing intuitions and sort of thinking about how, um, uh, thinking about how sensitive they were to assumptions about evolutionary forces. And the models got elaborated, and some tentative hypotheses were proposed. And eventually, the conceptual models uh, were sophisticated enough that people began to kind of try to use the principles to understand behavior that actually occurred. 
And so people uh, doing theory made connections, virtual or indirect, with people who actually collected data. And those people began to test the hypotheses. And it was, I think, um, uh, the field gained traction because it generated, at least sometimes generate predictions that could be tested, and it gave insight about processes for which we had no other really good explanation. So it was productive. It generated a tremendous amount of empirical work. Um, it wasn't smooth sailing the whole way. Sometimes we uh, went, uh, followed dead ends. Sometimes we, um, uh, um, we didn't make as much progress for a while. Some of the uh, some of the theories turned out to be not very tractable. Some of them turned out to be not not quite correct. Um, but it has been very productive because it's testable, it's falsifiable, it generates insights, and it's particularly cool when uh, we're able to explain um, things that seemed otherwise quite counterintuitive. So things like infanticide, the idea that infanticide was an uh, evolutionary uh, strategy that was favored by selection because it increased male reproductive success was extremely unintuitive. Uh, and, uh, and yet it turned out to have, um, it turned out to be um, very important. So, um, so this, this search for good reasons uh, was really productive in evolutionary biology. And I think this is, what might happen for evolutionary psychiatry. I think we're at the very early stages now. Randy's book maps out what an approach to psychiatric phenomena might look like. And I think it will draw people in who want to extend the ideas, build more sophisticated models, and begin to test the ideas in the real world. But it's going to be really hard because the phenomena itself is so difficult to study. And I think that that is just a huge, huge problem. So one of the problems that Randy talks about in the book is how much, how much trouble psychiatrists had and its approaches to basically characterizing the things it's supposed to be worried about, right? So going from a uh, fairly unsystematic um, kind of impressionistic descriptions of, uh, of uh, disorders to checklists of symptoms uh, to um, which ignore a lot of the sort of narrative history that Randy ignores. I mean, the reason that people have been having so much trouble is because it's super, super hard. So, I mean, I'm just basically sympathetic to the difficulty of the endeavor. Um, and yet, I'm also really aware that the stakes are really high. So it turns out it doesn't really matter to my baboons if my hypothesis for why they do what they do is right or wrong. I mean, there's some stakes for me because it's embarrassing to be wrong and make predictions that are false, et cetera. But the baboons don't care. I mean, they just really don't care. It really doesn't matter because they're going to do what they're going to do no matter what. But the, the, the psychiatry, psychiatry's problem is that the stakes are very high, not just in terms of the amount of money we spend on psychiatric drugs or um, the, you know, how much time we spend writing a DSM, you know, six or whatever, but because people's lives and feelings are at stake and that the, and there are a lot of miserable people in the world. I was, I'm not now, very happy now. Um, but, um, and so the, I think that's an added problem that the stakes are high, getting it right matters. And so this is going to make the endeavor profoundly, I think profoundly important, but also um, extremely difficult. So I think it's a great start. And um, probably lots of things we think now will turn out not to think later. But the thing is that you have to start thinking about it. So. Okay. so it's very fitting that we now turn to the psychiatrist on our panel. Uh, who is grappling with all these complexities. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Dr. Cynthia Stonington, uh, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. Dr. Stonington is a leading Alzheimer's researcher, as well as chair and a highly respected clinician who, from what it sounds like, she runs all of wellness at, at Mayo for, for everybody. 
Um, Cynthia was herself a Mayo Medical School graduate at the original Rochester campus. Following medical school, she completed her internship and residency at the Stanford University Medical Center focusing on medicine, neurology, um, and psychiatry, of course. Um, Dr. Stunnington's current research efforts involve neuroimaging, and she applies it um, to uh, machine learning. Um, she applies machine learning to imaging and cognitive sciences for the purpose of predicting cognitive decline in Alzheimer's patients. Um, she also tests exercise and other socially engaging activities as, and their potential for reducing cognitive declines at key points in, in treatment. And she also explores the cognitive and uh, environmental um, mechanisms or emotional mechanisms underlying cognitive decline. Um, in addition to her academic interests, Dr. Stonington it has a very long-standing reputation as one of the Valley's leading psychiatrists. I refer people to Dr. Stonington all the time because uh, I'm frequently asked uh, who is the, who's the best top doc. In fact, she has received numerous awards. Sorry, sorry if I embarrass you. She's this distinguished fellow for the American Psychiatric Association. She's frequently named top doc, both in Phoenix Magazine, also nationally in the US News and World Report. And she is listed on Castle Connolly's list of exceptional women in medicine. Um, and one other thing that probably I may be the only person in this room that knows this about Cynthia, uh, Cynthia she's also quite a superb trombone player. <laughs> so it, anyway, uh, Cynthia, we, we look forward to hearing from you now. Hear me? Yes, now. So, there are good reasons, I'm here to tell you, for psychiatrists to read good reasons for bad feelings. There's even better reasons for psychiatry trainees to read good reasons for bad feelings. So, um, you know, I think the, the evolutionary framework actually does make really good sense to me as a clinician. I think it makes good sense to sci scientists as well. I think a lot of the answers that Randy talks about in his book may end up not all being correct, but the questions he asks, I think, are the, exactly the right questions to be asked. And, and so I think that is, in fact, you know, what makes this such an exciting book. Now, as a psychiatrist who's been in practice for at least, for more than 30 years, I can also tell you, and I've been sympathetic to this framework, I have to disclose, um, since I was a resident, so I, I've been thinking about this for a little while, um, but it makes really good sense to patients, and that's why it's so important. So to in part to ans answer that question of how we can really work with it, I can, I'm here to tell you, and I'll tell you a few stories from my patients. Um, where it really did seem to mobilize their engagement with, with therapy and, and their treatment. So, um, for instance, um, and this is pretty obvious, but because um, we've talked about anxiety and how that seems to be a very um, obvious case, but this is a, a, a high-functioning man who came to me with recur recurrent panic attacks that started in, child, in, in adulthood um, initially triggered by very claustrophobic situations, and then later um, triggered by thoughts of loss. He came to me because he was very worried that, he, that he, these were gonna get worse and worse, they were starting to get more frequent, and that he would sort of stop functioning and that he would fall apart. And it's a really common thing for patients with panic disorder to feel like they're gonna go crazy. You know, so it's very, very scary. So in explaining to him how we've evolved to have false alarms due to the cost benefit of doing so, as you've heard from, from several people already today about the sort of the smoke detector idea, um, it really was helpful to him because he began to realize that he was no longer, that he wasn't necessarily didn't have a broken brain, as, you, as, you, as you've said, but rather kind of a normal 
response to perceived threat. Um, in his case, we discovered that his smoke detector got sensitized even more so, besides the fact that he perhaps had some genes that may have made him more prone to anxiety, but his smoke detector got sensitized during his early years when he lived in a very high stress situation with an unpredictable, abusive father. So this was during a time that his brain was developing, and so his smoke detector got kind of tuned, very tuned. But he, he ended up being pretty, pretty high functioning and doing really well until um, later when there were threats a little bit more um, perhaps subtle at first that really started to trigger his smoke detector. When he was able to realize that that alarm was going off just as loudly as if it were a fire in the house than if it were just burnt toast, it was like, boom, oh yes, I can get that. So I'm not gonna go and I'm not necessarily gonna fall apart and be crazy because this is why my body is doing this so loudly, right? So then I can sort of say, oh, okay, so then, I can, uh, then I'm willing to sort of look at what, str what strategies I can take to address that um, situation. So clearly the, the strategy wouldn't be to be thinking or evacuate the house every time that, <laughs> that smoke detector went off because then that will in fact, you know, trigger that stress response system and make him, him more, more threat, um, sort of hypervigilant. So we talk, I talk to my patients a lot about how our brains are threat detectors and how we need to kind of manage and, and respond to that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and I think that um, obviously for the reasons that we've already said that, that thinking about anxiety disorders, thinking about obesity, thinking about eating disorders, addiction, um, ADHD, all of that makes good sense because, um, and, and I really like how Dr. Nessie talks about how there's a strong misunderstanding um, about how, you know, you don't want to be thinking about evolutionary um, selection causing disease, but really, for example, eating disorders not being shaped by selection, but by the mechanisms that regulate eating during famine. Now that makes much more sense. And when you start to think about it that way, about how these mechanisms were shaped during these times um, in the past where we don't necessarily have the same level of stimuli that we have now, if you think in the modern environment where we have easy access to food, easy access to alcohol and drugs, um, constant stimuli from our smartphones, from our computers, with all sorts of threats, all sorts of rewards going off all the time. Our poor old brain now isn't able to maybe deal with that, and it's very easy to get hijacked by those circumstances. And it starts, you start to think about it not just as a clinician, but as a public health person. If you start to think about it there, ah, now of course that makes sense why we have this epidemic of anxiety and depression among our young people who are glued to their smartphones. Because you know their, their brains are responding to these threats and rewards all the time. And it's very hard to turn that off. So um, the other thing that I found extremely helpful and I hadn't thought about in my many years before um, until reading this book was, was the whole idea about, about the adaptive value of depressed mood. And you know, for instance, I saw a patient um, recently who you know, came to me on therapeutic doses of antidepressants, still very depressed and anxious. We start to talk about, um, what, so it turns out that the situation in which her depression developed was one in which her husband was very um, controlling, very critical, um, pathologically jealous, um, and she, no matter what she did to try to convince him or to try to, to, to be better, you know, it wasn't working, it was all for naught. So she was kind of trapped, and she was, and, and the emotions that were being evoked were ones of entrapment and humiliation, which again, Dr. Nessie talk, points out are particularly depressogenic emotions. So what does she do in that situation when she's experiencing these strong emotions? Well, you know, if you thought about it, it would be kind of obvious to maybe try and leave the situation. That's the whole point of the adaptive value of those, those emotions. 
Um, but you know, there were so, there's a lot of social pressures to stay in a marriage, and um, you know, for the sake of the children, whatnot. And there's easy access to alcohol, which can dampen those emotions. <laughs> so then, becoming to be able to drink and sort of not have to have those emotions quite so strongly, um, not surprisingly, creates this vicious cycle, which then you become more depressed. And so at that point, after we start to unpack all this and start to look at that, what do you think? Do you think I should give her the latest and greatest new antidepressant to help those, that depression that isn't working with the current latest and greatest antidepressant? I don't think so. I think we need to start to look at understanding what is some of those depressogenic situations. <laughs> How can she respond to it in a more adaptive way and looking at some of the things that are getting in the way and you know, thinking about the alcohol perhaps not so much as a good thing, but maybe something that's keeping her stuck, and so on and so forth. So, um, so I think those are some practical examples of how this could be useful for a, a clinician. Now finally, in my hat, as, I, as, um, as Nancy mentioned, I also work with um, wellness and I'm very involved in understanding physician burnout, and I'm, I'm becoming very interested in the difference between men and women physicians and, 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 and burnout. So one, I was very fascinated by the idea in Dr. Nessie's book about how being subordinate to somebody with lesser abilities is perilous. So in fact, so in other words, showing your stuff is a is perceived as a threat, so that will, if you, if you were in that situation, you may risk um, ex attack or, or even expulsion from the group. So what is the solution? What's the adaptive solution when somebody's in a situation like that? Well, it would be to deceptively conceal um, your abilities, and how better to deceptively conceal that but to convince yourself that you're not worthy so as I started to think about it, perhaps this is per one of the solutions or one of the reasons that we see this sort of incredible difference between men and women in, in my profession in terms of um, um, number of women with imposter syndrome, number of women, for instance, with the same level of academic achievements, the, a man will much more quickly apply for academic advancements, whereas a woman will wait and wait and wait until she's really, really sure that she's worthy of it. And you will see that again and again. And, I'm, and I, So anyway, I just thought that was maybe a potential interesting application of, of that principle as well. So I, in, in closing, I would just say that I think um, I'll, there's a lot to be learned by asking these questions. I think that it does have value already today for clinicians and perhaps even from public health and, and also the way organizations may think about you know, how different, different um, subsets of us respond to um, organizational principles like, like um, in healthcare. Have the panelists come on up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm just going to invite you all to to present questions um, that we can you respond to. People, you probably ask people to use a microphone so people watching from a distance can see what you're talking about. Do Maybe someone have? could up pass the microphone. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, when, when you spoke about the problems being hard, 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 are you saying that the data, amount of data is just overwhelming, in which case AI is going to help sort through it? Is that what you mean by hard? I think what I mean is that um, characterizing the um, the mental and emotional landscape is difficult. It's hard to know, um, you know, uh, it's hard to know, uh, hard to, to quantify these descriptions. So talking about low mood or high mood, um, 
you know, how do you actually measure that? And what is associated with moods and emotions? And, and even the emotions themselves, uh, how do you know? It's hard to know exactly um, how to characterize them. So I mean it as a kind of empirical and descriptive problem. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you find a difference um, in different cultures on um, prevalence of mental health issues and how culture fits in with an evolutionary perspective. There was a time when I was more of an epidemiologist and rates of depression in the United States are the highest in the world and they are 10 times higher than those in Korea and Taiwan. If we could get the rates in the United States down to those levels, it would do more good than all of the therapy in the entire world. But no one knows why those differences exist. Wouldn't that be a lovely study to do? Um, others may, I haven't lived in other cultures really, but other people here have. That's you. That's me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I'm the token anthropologist. This isn't my field of study, but I know that um, one of the things that complicates cross-cultural comparisons is these are these um, measurement errors, or, or you know, who who says they're depressed, uh, and uh, what is what is be, is being depressed in Japan the same as being depressed in Spain, and the same as being depressed in the U.S. And it's just it's really hard, and so it's a hard problem. Uh, but there are, apparently, as my colleagues who work on this tell me, there are differences. And differences in how these things are perceived. Uh, is it a problem if you have really low mood or really high mood? Is it a problem if you're really anxious or not? Is it something that's characterized as something you need to deal with or not? And, um, um, but there are other things that seem to be, you know, under holding conditions constant pretty universal, so there's no place you can go where people aren't really keen on eating kinds of foods that we know are bad for us, right? These are appetites and tendencies that we see all over the world where people are exposed to uh, processed foods. Uh, we see the development of you know, problems in, in, in um, regulating what we eat and things like that. So there are Probably, my best bet is some things are very similar across the world and some things will probably differ and we don't really know yet. <coughs> uh, uh, just a question, uh, um, how applicable are animal studies to like understanding evolutionary psychiatry and hum humans? Are there certain disorders that are more or less unique to, uh, to us? like um, autism, can we, can we trace like genetic or even symptomatic evidence of, you know, of, of autism in other animal, animals, or is that something unique to us? Autism in other animals would be a very hard thing to figure out because autism is so deeply connected with the kinds of attachments uh, that, that people have. So I, I don't know of anybody who's tried to exactly do that, but we might turn to Joan again for asking, do her baboons show depression or something like it in certain circumstances? Want to tackle that one? Yeah, we are actually, Scott and I were just talking this on the way over. Um, I think it's hard to say. I know that when infants are orphaned, so they've lost their mom, uh, they display, or when they're separated from their mothers, they display a suite of behaviors which people describe as very much like a depressed person. Um, now, whether or not that is a superficial similarity or, or has some deep connection, deep, deep continuity, I think it's hard to say, but the behavioral postures and the kind of low affect, low activity rates, more withdrawn. Those things seem to be very similar. So that's probably one thing. Um, you know, and then uh, we do, people do personality analyses of, of temperament in animals and see things like um, nervous and anxious and things like that. But I don't know how systematic or how consistent that work is. So I think it's very hard to know. Certainly some things 
like uh, uh, autism, manic depression. I don't think we have good natural models for, although it may be possible in the lab working with um, other animals to, to create them. But I don't know very much about that. So I had one <coughs> uh, thought is it might depend upon how conserved the system is. So for example, anxiety problems you'd expect to find widely across mammals. And I know, here's a study I remember from my childhood practically, but uh, when rats are given the choice between drinking water plain or water flavor with alcohol, they prefer the plain water. You start delivering electric shocks to them and stressing them out, and they switch over and start preferring the water with alcohol in it for the reasons that you were describing, that you know, alcohol does have an effect of reducing anxiety. And you'd expect anxiety to be conserved across mammals because all mammals are, you know, maybe lions wouldn't have that problem, okay? But generally speaking, we, uh, <coughs> We should, we should be similar in some ways to other animals and then in other ways, like the cognitive, the things involving cognition, schizophrenia, autism, you know, it's going to be extremely hard. Could you talk a little bit about um, neurotechnology, like deep brain stimulation and optogenetics? I have a few colleagues back at Michigan who are working on that. And it looks most recently like it might actually work, although creating proper placebo trials is really hard uh, for something like that. But what they're doing, of course, is the same thing as most psychiatric drugs do, which is disrupting normal systems. The idea that we are replacing missing neurotransmitters and that kind of thing, that just doesn't seem right at all. What we're doing is wrecking uh, normal systems the same way we do when we block pain with aspirin or Tylenol or, or, or opiates. So. And just one step beyond that is doing brain surgery uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder and other kinds of things. That's happening, and for some desperate, desperate patients, it actually works and is worthwhile, despite the horror of you know, cutting parts of the brain out to prevent obsessive compulsive disorder. Once you get somebody who is not doing anything but washing their hands all day long, you, know, you gotta do whatever you can do. So there are great opportunities here, and it's very profitable, and therefore that research is going great guns. I'll just add that, um, so I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening in terms of brain science. I mean, this is a fantastically exciting time to be in the field because of that and because of these new kind of really our understanding of brain circuits and how how we can maybe help to redirect brain circuits in a way that's going to end up reducing symptoms and being helpful but I do think that again the the framework um, is really we don't want to lose <laughs> We don't want to forget the, big, the, the, the entire picture. So the brain is a huge part of the picture. Um, but I think we need to always start with, um, as, as Randy so well put out, um, um, explained, you start with understanding what was the situation that initially triggered symptoms that you don't want to end there. I mean, psychoanalysts, unfortunately, ended there, and that didn't work out so well. Um, but you want to understand what was the situation very importantly, how are, is the organism, how are we responding to the situation? What are we doing that's perpetuating symptoms? What are we doing that is adaptive and what are we doing that's maladaptive? So understanding that. And then, thirdly, of course, understanding the brain and what's going on and what are the, what are the circuits, what are happening in, in the brain circuits, what are happening that's kind of making it hard to shift out of those behaviors. So that's where I think these types of techniques can be incredibly helpful to help with that, to really really move us a little bit more in that direction. But we can't forget those other, those other pieces in working with real human beings because everyone has real situations, real emotions, real dynamics, and real responses that can get us really dug very deep if we don't understand that. Testing? Yeah. Uh, is there an optimal amount of depression in a normal person where it's constructive? Let's say in or reordering the way we think, uh, 
Is that is there a view to that? So, would you like to get a PhD? <laughs> because I've never seen a study on people who have inadequate um, low mood in the face of failure. I do think I've known people personally who just, you know, never get discouraged no matter what, and they often are very happy doing things that don't accomplish all that much. Um, which you've got to envy people like that, <laughs> very very often. Um, but you know. We should be studying people who have too much and too little of every single one of these kinds of things. And because we haven't taken an evolutionary viewpoint, we generally have just emphasized the people who are having bad feelings as if they're bad. I, actually, I, I didn't feel that that connected to my question. Oh, sorry. Okay. And, and, and I, it could be my fault, but there are instances where being depressed is appropriate. And, and I'm saying, in a normal person, it, it, has there been any looking at the constructive aspect of working through depression because it maybe reorganizes the brain in a positive way? Is that the way you understood I, my question? Well, yeah, that, that actually taps into something I do know about. Um, I spent three years one time doing a project on bereavement, a prospective study, where I thought the best way to figure out what was wrong with people who didn't have any grief would be to look and see what was wrong with their lives. Because I was quite confident that these people would have shallow relationships or other kind of problems or, or all the rest. It turned out we had wonderful data showing that these people who really didn't experience much bereavement after loss of a loved one were pretty regular people, actually. That there's no exactly normal, exact way to be bereaved. And it really influenced me, my own data, because my, my hypothesis that these folks would be having serious problems in their relationships just was not true at all. But your question is a deep one that needs real study, and maybe some of your others have comments about that. Um, so I would say, you know, I, so that's not an area that I've studied, and I, I you know, can't really answer it from that point of view, but I think where, I mean, I, the normal emotions are important and things like grief, I think it is really important to be able to, to recognize it and to process it. And I certainly have seen countless patients where they actively avoided experiencing normal emotions and they got themselves into a lot of trouble because of it. Um, and whether it be through a lot of physical symptoms <laughs> um, or through um, other, you know, m any number of problems. So I think, um, you know, you, it just makes sense that when you have something happen, at some point you want to be able to acknowledge it and process it. And when you tend to sort of try and defend against it and push away and do all those things, it ends up causing more problems than it solves. Um, so that's just based on my own, own sort of anecdotal many thousands of patients that I've seen over the years. Well, I think Dan Gonzalez is going to call a halt to this in just a moment, but I, I have just, in this whole discussion, I think there's been a bias, and it's probably the same bias that's in my book. There's huge emphasis on situations causing emotions, and there's a huge de-emphasis on the fact that some people just are that way their whole lives. And seeing thousands of patients in the anxiety clinic, my estimate is that about half of the patients are there because of their situations, and about half of them are there because they've always been that way. Um, and that is a whole different kind of evolutionary question about why those genes and predilections are that way. And I feel like both my book and this evening's panel have de-emphasized that, and I wouldn't want anybody who has those kind of tendencies. And I think you are a good example. I was thinking of you. you know, there's some people who are just anxious, and it doesn't do them any good, and it doesn't have to do with the situation, and taking drugs to fix it, or doing whatever you can do to fix it, is a wonderful thing. Comment? I think it's true. I mean, I think that everything, pro I mean, kind of a truism for is that everything has, you know, a genetic component and an environmental component, and nothing is completely, you know, environmental. Nothing's completely genetic. And I think that, um, uh, and I think that that, but I think that there are some cases where. The genetic predisposition is the overriding factor, and it's it's expressed in any you know tends to be expressed you know in in any environment. And um, you know after I sort of came to the understanding that I had 
I, not actually, not everyone was like me. So I just, I grew up in a household where everybody was just like me. We worried about everything. And I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, the, it's like the family sport. And I just thought everybody was like that, but it turns out they're not. And, um, and so, you know, uh, it's hard to separate, you know, it's always hard to separate genes and environment, but um, uh, there are probably different explanations for genetic predispositions and situational responses. And um, uh, they probably have different um, explanations. And, but what would be interesting is whether or not they also had different treatments, which is not so clear. Well, again, I mean, I think I would say that, that um, everyone who has genes that predispose them to having anxiety just because, you know, still have situations in their life and still have responses to that situation. So that part is exactly the same. Um, it just mean, may mean that it's a lot harder to kind of keep it in check if you've already starting out up here. So and you have to recognize, and that's the part that's so important. That's the brain part that we do need good treatments for, for the brain. So absolutely, 100%, you know, sign me up. That is exactly right. But you still have to look at those other, other things. OK. So this concludes our evening. Thank you all very much. One more round of applause. For